Yeah, but that's a. There you go. Yeah, I can't poke down like that though. Let's. <laughs> that any? Yeah, if I turn this way, no one's gonna hear anything. What's that? Yeah, I want it to be under my chin then. Let's see. How's that? No? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. So, oh, all the slides are available on uh, GitHub there under my account. Um, but I'm going to do introductions and chit chat when we start installing our first VM because we kind of have downtime as we're waiting for things to happen. So I'm going to let that, let that happen then. So needless to say, I'm not going to plow into this without saying who I am. I'm just going to say it a little bit later. So what's required? I'm also going to talk about sort of the overview of it during one of those downtimes as well. So what do we need to set this up? We need a downloaded ISO file of the distro you want to use in your lab. For this example, uh, we're using a Red Hat variant, so either Red Hat, CentOS, Scientific, or one of the Red Hat-based distributions. Um, you need a host computer that already has your virtualization software installed. Um, we're going to use Fedora for the host, because I have Fedora on my laptop, and we're going to use KVM for our virtualization software. Because it's built in, it's convenient, and also uh, makes some of these steps a little bit easier. Um, you could use CentOS, would look almost identical to this. Uh, you could use a different computer for your host if you wanted to. You could use something like a Windows host with Hyper-V or uh, VMware or Mac with VMware or whatever other virtualization stuff you have, but the implementation details are going to be different in how you set up your lab, and I can't cover all of those in one talk. But if you're more familiar with VMware, I don't think any of the stuff we're doing here would seem very out of line. Uh, it should be pretty easy to adapt that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a VM to be our local software repository. So here are the steps we're going to go through. We're going to start Vert Manager. We're going to select a new VM. We're going to do local install media, press forward, use ISO image, and then you browse your local directories for that. Um, and then we select the ISO image that we've previously downloaded. So let me get to that. Okay, I cheated a little. I clicked the icon already to start Vert Manager. So I'm going to do a new VM. We're going to do local install media. Is that all readable enough? It's a little bit small. Okay. And like I say, there are some snapshots. If you go on the GitHub, the slides I have online, I do have some snapshots in there. I don't have them in this because I'm actually doing it live. But there are some, snap there are some screenshots of uh, some of these steps, particularly this one. So we are going to choose our media. We'll do browse and then browse local. Here's our ISO image. You might be saying, wow, why are you using such an old version? I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. OK. The standard memory in one CPU is fine. We're going to give it a little more disk space in case you have a larger um, ISO. If you did something like download the, uh, if you downloaded the everything CD, you need uh, the DVD. You need a little more space, and I'm just calling it AA repo to put it at the top of our list to make it easier to find. So that's going to install. Let's not test. We don't spend time doing that. So we'll give this a minute or two. Okay. So, oh, I already went through these steps. Choose your memory and CPU options. One gig, one CPU is fine. For the disk image, give it a little more than 10. If you have a small ISO like this, I could actually have left it at 10 gigs, but give it a little bit more. Uh, and then name the VM. Now we're going to install CentOS 7. Uh, the steps are pretty easy. You install CentOS 7, select your language. Uh, Select your installation destination. Let it go with the defaults with all of that. There's no reason to change any of that. And then we'll get to a few steps that are different where we're going to select infrastructure server, make sure we select FTP server, and make sure we select our network to make life easier for later. So language, English, unless you want otherwise. Here's where the partitioning, some people complain about the partitioner in here. All we're going to do is we're going to select done because it already picked our device correctly because there's only one available. But we'll let it automatically do that. Here are some of the key sections. When we get to software selection, 
We want for this to be an FTP server, so we're going to select infrastructure server and then select FTP server. That's all really small, and I can't do anything about that right now. Sorry about that. So what we're doing is this is also selected on those, uh, the slides that are online. So I've selected on our base environment, I've selected infrastructure server, and then for the add-ons, I've selected FTP server. Those are the two things we need for this. And one other thing to make your life easier, turn on the networking by default. Trust me, this can be fixed later, but it's a pain in the neck. So we're going to let that install. So we've got two steps we can do here. Let me go back and catch up with the slides. Network and host name, beginning. We can do our root and user account. And so for our lab, I would do something simple for your password and let it complain about it being weak. So I did password, password, and create a user. So we don't have problems like we saw some, with some other ones. The same password. So now this is going to chug away for a few minutes. You probably can't read the numbers. It's on 77 of 480 already. So we've got a couple of minutes. So now let's do some introduction stuff since we have to wait a few minutes for that VM to install anyway. So I'm Bob Murphy. Uh, I've been a, a Linux user since back in the Slackware days, like the late 90s, like 96, 97. Uh, currently, I'm working as a Linux sysadmin for the last few years. I'm currently working on my RHCE, and not coincidentally, the way this lab is set up is very tuned to what the requirements are for that. So this is sort of, if you're wondering, why is he setting up a lab in this manner? Why is he using Red Hat for this? This is why I'm doing that. Could you do it with other distros? Yes. I don't have all the details on all of those, though. Um, my contact information is there, and I'll put the, when we get some downtime later, I'll put the uh, slide back up for the GitHub page. But if you go to GitHub uh, slash MurphNJ, I only have a couple things in there. So if you find our lab, H-O-U-R lab, um, that's where you'll find the slides. Um, so let's see. Okay. It's getting close. So that'll go for just a couple minutes. Um, I also wanted to thank the uh, Southeast Linux Fest people. They always put on a good uh, production here. They have awesome uh, AV stuff. And, uh, and thank all of you for coming out here. You know, it's, uh, it's early on Sunday, and it's a little tough to uh, drag out here. But, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys taking the effort and coming out. Yeah, yeah, thank you for neglecting your families and coming here and doing this. So we've got a few minutes of uh, post-installation tasks. OK, so what we're going to do next, so that's going to finish in the background. That's going to take another minute or two. We're going to reboot, and we're going to log into the repo server. And these are the steps we're going to do to set up our FTP server. We're going to start and enable the FTP service through systemd. We're going to open the firewall port for FTP to get through. Um, and then we're going to make that change permanent. Then we're going to copy the files from the ISO that we just have. We're going to mount that ISO back to the VM. We're going to copy all the files locally to the repo server. And then we're going to create a file to tell that computer, so our repo, or our first VM, our repo VM, we're going to tell it to get all its updates from its own FTP server. Okay. So that way, if you want to install a new package, it picks it up from itself, from the files that are available on the ISO. And I'm going to explain why that's an interesting thing when we have downtime, while we're waiting for things to copy. That should be almost done. Post-installation setup tasks. Sorry. Um, this is part of why this takes an hour, because there are a few, you know, as we're installing VMs, it takes a little while. Any questions for what we've done so far? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, all of this, none of this is being done remotely. This is all being done on this laptop. So, and something I don't really talk about in here, but I really probably should, since we have a minute or two, I'll talk about it now. You don't need a whole lot of power. Like if you were studying for the RHCSA or the RHCE, you don't need a ton of power. 
I picked up a laptop with 16 gigs of RAM because I wanted more stuff to play with uh, and an i7. I have done these sort of labs on a reflashed Chromebook with a Celeron dual core processor and four gigs of RAM. Four gigs of RAM I think is sort of the bare minimum, but a, a dual core Celeron that was a Chromebook reflashed into Linux running Fedora, doing the same thing, it takes longer. I would actually show it off with this. Okay, we could finally reboot. Uh, I would show it off with this, but it makes all of these steps take longer, like those post-installation steps take forever on that thing because it doesn't have a lot of, lot of horsepower. Um, so I don't subject you to that because that would make this take even longer. So when you say, can you do it on your desktop? Absolutely. I find the real limiting thing is RAM. Four gigs is your absolute minimum to run a couple of VMs. Eight is much more comfortable. Uh, and the, the more, the merrier. You know, it makes it much easier. But to do this stuff here, and this is our root and password, unfortunately, you know what? Let me get this, let me SSH, let me see if I can SSH into this and make that bigger. I can't do anything about the console. Is that 122? Oh, not 120. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong number. Give me just a second here. Minor technical, 47, that's why. Like, oh, if I don't have network, this goes really badly. Okay. Actually, this network I don't need, just to, so there's no shenanigans there. I need no ex external networking for this. So, this I can make larger. Let's go down one for this. You know, every time I click in that console window, I can't switch between my screens, which is a little bit maddening. So let's do some bigger, bigger, bigger. How about that? Okay. So now is that more readable? I can even do, I could probably get away with one more. There we go. So. So now we're logged into our FTP server. This should make life a little bit easier. I just have to pass by that to get to my slides. So here are our steps. And again, all these steps are online. You don't have to furiously write these down. We're going to do system control start VSFTPD. So just so you know, VSFTPD is the internal, um, is the default FTP server in a Red Hat system. Uh, we're going to start it, we're going to enable it. You could do status to see if it's running. We'll, we'll see if we do that. And then we're going to set the firewall. We're going to do firewall command, add service FTP, and then do permanent so it persists through a reboot. Uh, and then you have to do a reload because that only uh, puts it in the config file. So then we do a reload so it reloads that config and makes that active. And then we'll get our IP address, but we already have our IP address because I uh, went into it here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do hey, we're going to accidentally start another shell by hitting the trackpad. We'll do system control start VSFTPD. We'll do enable, which will start it at next reboot. We'll do firewall command permanent add service equals FTP. Now, so that wrote that to our config. We're going to do a reload so that it puts that in currently. We're going to type reload correctly. Hey, they're not picky about that. That's awesome. If I'd only known, I could have just rolled with that and not, uh, not made a fuss. So let's see. Oh, our IP address, right? It was 47. We're going to need that. So. So now, we're, now what we're going to do is we're going to copy all the files from the CD to our local repo so that they're all available. And there might be a question about why don't you just mount the CD? I'll get into that in a minute. Okay. So we need to go into details. We are going to the CD, and we're going to pick the very same CD that we installed our uh, operating system from, 
We're going to choose that, so that mounts that there. Uh, we're going to do make sure I'm in root. Okay, uh, we'll do Hey, how come that didn't show up? Browse read only shareable? Hmm. Bear with me for a minute here. What's that? Did I type temp? Yeah, it's saying the device doesn't exist. Hmm. All right, let me unmount that and remount it and see if that works better. The demo gods are being cruel today. Let's see. Kill that no media. Let's see. That's the right one. Of course, I've only done this like four times in the last couple of days, and ever, this has never been a problem. Oh, you know what? If one hits the apply button, I bet it's going to work. There it goes. Okay. You have to hit the apply button, by the way, after you do that. News to me. Uh, now let me refresh my memory. Okay. And I'm going to use rsync just because it gives us, yeah, I mean, you could just copy the stuff, but I'm going to use rsync simply because it gives us some uh, feedback as to how far it's gone along. So we're going to do rsync.hp a dash abhp we'll go from temp to var here's the interesting part to var ftp pub what we're going to do is we're going to put all these files in an easily accessible directory that the ftp daemon already sets up that's the only reason i use the pub directory is because it's there all the permissions are set right all the se linux stuff is set right that all goes in nice and easy so we'll do that now we've got a couple of minutes to chat again. So let's see. So why do we set up a home lab like this? You might be thinking, you know, you, you said you're setting up a home lab. Why are you doing it this way? This seems a little bit odd. So it gives us a couple of things. It lets us easily set up and break down and redo new machines. But more importantly, uh, well, it also gives you stability in versions of the operating system. Again, when you're doing the Red Hat test, they tend to test on an older version of Red Hat. So if you have all the newer spiffy stuff, it may fix a bug that you find in the older version. So you probably want to practice on an older version for your VMs. I mean, it's good to be you know, current on what's up to date, but if you're looking for that test, sticking with the older version is probably a good idea. Now, if you do a yum update, you don't accidentally get upgraded to the latest version and stuff changes out from under you. Uh, and this is the part, this last item is the one that was the most important one for me, is you don't need the network when you're doing your studying. So I've been in a situation where, okay, I've got a couple hours, I'm sitting in a, a sandwich place, I've got my lunch, I've got like an hour and a half. You know what? I'll, I've got my PDF of all of my study materials. Let me do some stuff. Okay, let's do a web server. Yum install, you know, uh, HTTPD. Doesn't work. Why? because the network in this place doesn't work correctly. Now I'm dead in the water. I can't continue with what I want to work on because, ooh, it's finished already. I can't, finish, you know, I can't continue on what I want to work on because I can't install the web server. With this, when we point our VMs to this repo, we can do absolutely everything you can do with a stock Red Hat install with no network at all. And that was part of the reason, more than anything else really, that I put my machine in airplane mode just to show you that I'm not pulling in any resources from that aren't on this machine. And the only thing I have on this machine that's interesting is what I asked for in the beginning, the virtualization software and an ISO image. That's all I need to set all of this up to do basically all the tasks for that certification study. Okay, so all of our files are copied over. Let me not get ahead of my slides here. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, now the way Red Hat works, for anyone that's not familiar, is there are files called .repo files 
that tell it where to find its updates. By default, it either sends you to the Red Hat site or to the CentOS site, which is actually still Red Hat, you know, and send you there for your updates. What we're going to tell it is don't go to Red Hat or don't go to CentOS for your updates. Go to my server here. And I'm going to do it on this one simply for simplicity. I'm going to have it refer to its own FTP server. That way I can test it out before I've gone to an outside machine. So here are the things we need to do. We're going to go to where those repo files are, which is in etsy yum.repos.d. And we're going to move everything that's in there out before we do an update. Right now, you don't notice I haven't done a yum update. You know, everybody says you, you install your server, do a yum update. No, no, we don't want that for this particular thing. We want to go in there, take all those repo files that tell it where to get its updates and get them out. Now, if you're feeling bold, you could just delete them. I tend to move them to the root folder just so if I wanted them later, I could go retrieve them and you know, do an update over the network. Um, so I move those out and we create our own repo. And you can see, I do edit, I'll do Vim, uh, VI, uh, network repo. And these are the components you need to make that work. You need the name of the repo in square brackets and then for redundancy sake, you need name equals network, which is the name of our repo. You can name this repo whatever you want, by the way. Network is just arbitrarily what I call it. Here's the real good part. Here, here's the punchline. Base URL equals, and then the, the, the uh, network and the location of your file. So in our case, it's going to be FTP colon slash slash 192, 168, 122 dot, anyone remember? 47 slash pub, because that's where we dumped all our files. If I did this right, I'm going to double check, because if I put it in a slightly different directory, I could just change that here and everything will work the way it's supposed to. And then we do GPG check equals zero. We know where all our files came from. We're not getting these over the network. No one's going to be hijacking our repo, because it's all on our machine anyway. So we'll turn that off to simplify things. Then we're going to save and quit. And then we're going to test it by doing a yum clean all to take, say, take any cached information you had from the old servers, throw that out. And then we're going to yum install something. I usually do FTP or I do screen or something like that. doesn't matter. And you don't have to do the last step, FTP localhost. If it has gotten this far, if the install works, our FTP server is working because we use it this way. Now, theoretically, for your repo machine, you could just give it the local directory path here. But this gives us a test right in the process. And then we also have the added bonus of, if we want to not type all this in next time, when we have a second VM, we can just pluck this file out of this, put it in, and everything works. You don't have to retype all this stuff. So that's, that's the reason I do this on the local machine when I can make it a little bit simpler. We make it so it's universal across all of them. So let's go through this. So we'll do CD. Oh, let's check and make sure the files ended up where I thought. LS var FTP pub. Beautiful. So that's all our files from the, from the DVD. So we'll do cd etsy yum.reposed. And you see we have all the CentOS files. All of these files will, show you, will send you to the CentOS, uh, send you to the CentOS servers for that. So let's do CentOS base. Just so you see, theirs are a little more complicated, but it's basically the same thing. They have a name, they have a, oh, they have a mirror list. We're going to use a base URL to keep it simple. They want to do GPG checks. Now, of course, if you're installing stuff over the network, you want to leave those GPG checks enabled. For ours, we can get rid of that. So let's create our own. So let's do move all of this stuff to root. And then we're going to do vi network.repo. So I'm going to go through the same steps I just showed you on the other slide. We're going to do network, we're going to start in cert mode first, network, and we do name equals network, we're going to do base URL, we're going to make typos, equals FTP, 192.168.122.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.
to make that work. So let's do a yum clean all. Let's do a install screen. We'll do yum install screen just for completeness. Okay, if it's gotten this far, boom. So now we have a working repository of the entire install DVD on our local machine. So we basically got all the pieces in place now. So just to demonstrate a little bit more, I'm going to install another VM, and instead of installing it from the CD like I did before, I'm going to install it from this repository. I'm going to do a network boot from this repository and get all the files from here. Now, mind you, it's not quite smart enough to tell it to use this as a repo even if I install it from here, but it'll prove that everything works correctly. So, let's go back here. Let's create another new one. Now, this is the one part where if you're doing this on VMware, or you're doing this on Hyper-V, I don't think you get this option in here because this basically does like a fake Pixie boot within it and boots off of the CD from our repo. I don't think you can do that very easily from those. This does some of those steps for you. So we're going to do a network install. Unfortunately, this is the part I can't really enlarge. Let's go forward. So we're going to do for our URL, FTP, 192.168.122. I'm going to put dots between things and everything. Pub. Do, 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 do. Why is it taking so long? Let's see. Ah, if you can see here, it says CentOS 7, which tells me it's working. Doing a live demo, it's very happy for me to see that it actually picked that up because it took a little while. So now we can go with the defaults for this. You can even cut it down a little. Let's do that. So it takes a very little amount more to do that. See, now it's booting. It's doing a pixie boot, and it's, but it's pointing it at our repo. It's gotten this far, it's probably going to work. Give me a graphical screen and then I can relax a little bit here. That looks good. Come on. All right. So, so we've done a successful boot from our local repo. So we do some of the same steps. Obviously, we don't need to set this up as an FTP server. Uh, we're going to do the installation destination. Oddly, network, since we're installing over the network, you don't have to bother with that this time. And we'll let it stay at minimal. I'm just going to do a root password. I'm not even going to bother with the user on this one. And then we have a couple minutes. So let me go back to the slides. So there we go. So that's our second VM and we're pulling the information directly from the first VM. Oh, I got completely ahead of all of my slides here, so I just did all these steps. Went to the Virtual Machine Manager, select a new VM, but instead of a local CD install, we're doing it from the network. For the URL, we type in our FTP site that we've set up, memory CPUs and disk to taste, and now we have time for a few questions. Oh, okay, that we don't do yet. Any questions so far? It's early. Everyone was drinking last night. Stun silence. No? Um, so this keeps all of your stuff nice and local. All of, your, uh, all of your versions stay coherent. Because if you do something like update the system, so, so if you do something like you have it live, you update the system, and then you pull in the RPMs off the CD to do that theoretical web install, your versions are off because the CD is behind what you've pulled off the network. It's very convenient to keep all this stuff here. And being able to connect when we set up that repo file, you know, you, I can't talk too much because there's NDAs on the test stuff, but that's a handy skill to have, by the way, where I set up that network.repo. Just a hint. You may see that. Uh, let's see. This doesn't need to be in front anymore. Let's see. Okay, so we've got our, uh, yeah, it's already into post-installation tasks. This is the part when it does the post-installation tasks that takes forever when it's setting up the, the kernel in the net RAM FS and all that stuff on that Celeron machine I was talking about. It took forever, because I was going to bring that one, because it's smaller and lighter, it would have been convenient. I said, 
No, instead of taking five minutes, it takes like 12 minutes, and I can't, even I can't talk for that long. KVM, because it's all built in. Like I say, if you install a CentOS or a uh, Fedora or a Red Hat system, you have everything you need on that system. Sure, and you can do that, but these are useful skills to have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you could certainly clone your VMs off of that, but having the repo so that everything stays local is still, still valuable. So, making your, so creating your new VMs on this is not necessarily the fastest way to do this, and having snapshots and being able to roll back is valuable as well, but uh, it is good to have this local repo so that way even if you do Say you want to tear down and build up fast, so you're just going to clone off VMs. That's fine, but having this repo set up here means you can install new software into those. You don't, you don't want to start from a machine with everything installed, because then if you, you know, if you run into a problem, you don't know what packages you need to make that happen. You want to practice from a base old, you know, not necessarily old, but a, a base minimal install, and install the packages you need to get the tasks done, so that way you know what packages you need to get the task done. Doo -doo. So let's see, almost done. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull that repo file off of the other machine and you'll see that we'll be able to use from this new VM, we'll be able to pull stuff off the, 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 the our original repo VM. What's that? What do you mean, like which book or? Uh, the, the Sander Van Voot books seemed good to me. Uh, the Jang stuff I was using supplemental, supplementally as well. I read through the Asgard Gory book. I found it really hard to follow. That was like reading stereo instructions to me. I'm like, this is, that, that one seemed the, the definitively worst of the three. Uh, where the, Jang, the Sander book and the Jang book seemed, seemed better for what I was doing. Okay, so we're done. We're going to reboot. Oh, I got to do another SSH session. Well, let's see. Ah, I have to get the IP of that one first. Give me just a minute. These boot up pretty quick when they're on minimal. Let's see. Don't worry about seeing what's on this screen. I'm going to blast over to the other one. 129. Okay. So here we are. We have a, another working VM. We're going to do CD Etsy VM.reposed. We're going to do a move. We're going to get everything out of here. And then instead of redoing that file from scratch, which I can do, uh, we're going to do an SCP from on The only problem with SCP is I don't get command completion, so I can't cheat and make sure I have all my things right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy, I'm going to do a remote copy from 47, which is our repo machine, the Etsy yum repos D directory, the network.repo file, and I'm going to copy it to our current location. And it worked. So now we're going to do the same test we did before. We're going to clean, make sure there's nothing in the, uh, in the cache, and then we're going to install the program from our repo. So we'll do yum clean all. And then we're going to do yum inst install. Ha ha, look at that. So now all of this stuff is pulling from this. So this is a separate VM, and it's pulling all of its update material off of our original VM. So now, if you have this all set up, now I could sit anywhere do everything in either of those, either any of those uh, RHCE or RHCSA books with exactly what I have here. I need no network connection. I need nothing from the outside. Of course, it's nice to be able to Google stuff, but I'm not dependent on 
anything from the outside to be able to do stuff on this. Now, I'm talking about studying for now, but you could do stuff like if you want to test web servers, if you want to, you know, install stuff, everything is there, but it's just what's in the Red Hat repos. If you want to go outside of that, obviously you're going to need something additional. So we did all of that, time for questions. Oh, okay. You know, I'm a step ahead of my slides each time here. Uh, so there's our repo. I did the SCP root at blah, 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 to our IP, yum repos D, network repo. I did a, an explicit path because I didn't know where I was starting from there, but that did the same step we just did. Or you could recreate it from scratch with those four lines and it worked successfully. So now we have our complete, like I say, home lab. Yeah, some people want more out of this. I actually posted some information on this up on Reddit and people said, oh, I've got 18 different operating systems and four servers. I'm like, yeah, okay, I can't do that in an hour though. This is, this is one presentation for one thing here. Focus towards this. So if you're studying for the Red Hat exams or Linux Plus or any of these things, you've got everything you need right there and everything works. So if you want these slides, and like I say, if you get the, what looks like the latest version of the slides, the one that says 7P, that has some screenshots in there as well. So it'll have a couple of spots that I thought it might be beneficial to have them, but I don't have them in this one because I'm obviously doing everything. I'm showing you everything that would be in those screenshots. Um, and there's some older versions of it in there as well. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, if you have questions outside of this, murph at member.fsf.org, or uh, I'm on the Fediverse at murph at fostodon.org. That's Mastodon and Pleroma and that whole wonderful ecosystem of interesting things I'd encourage you to take a look at. Um, and other than that, I am uh, more than happy to answer questions. Okay, I'm going to start with you. I'm in a largely Red Hat based environment and it would be useful and I think it's still a valid, uh, still a valid certification. Uh, they've actually just announced changes to it so it's gonna be more Ansible based. So it's gonna be a uh, little more DevOpsy for the, the, uh, for the CE portion of it if you care to go down. Yeah, I, I've sort of been looking at the material saying this feels dated, you know, you're setting up web servers, you're setting up mail servers. You know, that's a little less relevant today. I think they're making it more relevant. And the fact that it's a live exam where you sit down in a room and you have a server and they say, here it is. It's, you can log in, you've got some problems. You need to fix these things. You know, here's a list of stuff you need to do. That takes it beyond the usual, you know, memorize, regurgitate, uh, you know, uh, multiple choice type of thing. It's considerably harder. So I think it shows a, a higher degree of competency, but that's just my opinion. I don't hire people either, so. Yeah, that, that's why I'm still pursuing it. So, yes? Yes, I don't have that information. What you would do is, no, it, actually it isn't, because I've gone through it. I failed it once, so I, I have a pretty good idea of what's, what's in a lot of it, although they have different versions of it. Um, you can, what you can do is there's a program, and I don't recall the name of it, it's like yum download only, I think. So what you could do is say, say we were on our repo. I'm not going to demonstrate it because I don't know if it's going to work, uh, <laughs> especially since I have the network turned off. Uh, you could do that. You could download all the packages, put them in the folder, like in our pub folder in packages just to keep life sane. You put them where all the other packages are. And then you run a repo, gen, repo generate or generate repo. There's a program to do that. So you could take any collection of files and make it into a repo. We don't have to go through that because we copied all the files from the CD, so those index files come along with it. So our repo is exactly what's on the CD. That's why I don't pick and choose, because it keeps it nice and neat. Uh, we're just copying everything from the CD. Oh, and you reminded me, I got a point I got to bring up. Um, so we pull everything in from the CD. We have that index file already. If you wanted to make a custom repo with just your packages and the dependencies that you need for it, you can create your own repo outside of that. But that means you could download a full list of packages from Red Hat, get all the updated packages, run that create repo command, and then point, either put it where you have these, or you could point it to a new repo for that, and you could have updated packages. I don't do that as part of this, but it's certainly a feasible thing to do. Let me mention one thing before I get to your question. I'm not going to forget about you, though. So I got, a, I got, a, I got feedback from Reddit, because, you know, they're gentle. 
Um, and they said, why don't you just leave the CD mounted to your repo and do that? Were you going to ask that too? Okay. Okay. Um, they said, why don't you just leave the CD there? That way you don't have to allocate space to it. I tried, I, I'm thinking in the back of my head, why didn't I do that? I tried that. There's SE Linux problems with that. SE Linux, you can't change the context of it because it's a read-only file system. Now, if there's a way around that, that's great. I don't know what that is now. So I went with this because it works. Um, if you can change those SE Linux context on that ISO file, I guess you can make that work. And of course, for those of you that say, well, just turn SE Linux off like everybody else does. You can't do, if you're doing RHCE, you need to have SE Linux on at the end, otherwise you fail. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't run into a lot of problems with it either, but turning it off or putting it in permissive mode is not the right solution to this problem. Maybe it's the right solution to your problem, not the right solution to this problem. Okay, now I'll answer your, I, I didn't want to forget the, the CD thing. Yes. That's a good question. Maybe you could. Maybe you could replace those repo files on there. No one has ever asked that. Now I'm sort of interested to try. Although it's good to know how to create that file. Like, yeah, in, in, the, in the short run, it would be cool to dump that in so that way you don't have to do it. Helpful hint, know how to make that file. Like, if you forget how to do that, you might run into problems. <laughs> if I can be ever so subtle about what's required there, it's good to know how to do that. Okay, more questions? Yes, sir. Oh yeah, I would definitely do Rel8 now, because that's where things will be going, and they're very long-lived. Uh, I started this train on I started this train on Red Hat six. I've switched over to seven, and uh, I'm not switching. I'm probably going to take the test in November-ish, so I'm not going to switch to eight. And uh, yeah, if I were doing this anew, uh, after you take the RHCE, which has stayed the same, uh, RH SA. Yes, sorry, I'm getting my my acronym out. Uh, the SA is, the, is pretty much the same. For the CE, I'd look into that newer one that does Red Hat 8 and Ansible and all that stuff. So, a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Thought I, just trying to be attentive. Okay. I'm happy to answer a question about earlier on. We've, we've gotten through all the material, so I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah. Yeah, that was sort of like your question. You could, but for our purposes, we explicitly don't want to do that because we want to keep all of the versions the same and stay on the version that we started with. So that's sort of the reason to do this. Could you do that? Yeah, that, the answer is similar to what he was asking as far as like doing the you pull down the packages and you put it, you know, and you could script all of this, put in a cron job or something. Uh, pull down the new packages with yum, download only, put them in there, run the create repo command, and it would keep that up to date. So you could certainly do that sort of thing, and I believe that would work, although I don't, haven't really tried it. All the tools are there to do it. Yeah, because I'm looking at it not from uh, getting an RHC Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, well, you saw how quickly it installed packages and stuff. You know, that was, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you can do that. Can you just mirror the online repo through the system? Yeah, I bet you could. Yeah. yeah. You, could, you could mirror that online repo and then do your create repo, so that way you have those index files so that it finds stuff correctly. Yeah, yeah I, I don't see any reason you couldn't do that. That should work. Yeah, 
Yeah, if you're if you're trying if your purpose is to keep current, that would be an excellent way to do it. And that's sort of doing a a zero budget satellite slash spacewalk kind of thing. You're sort of saying just just keep it in the repos and I'll update my own machines from there. You know, it's less management, but it keeps all your files local. Um, any other questions? No? Nothing else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm under time again. I'm doing these, you know. I have to apologize. I was raised by New Yorkers, so I speak very quickly and I go through this stuff faster and faster each time as I get more. Oh, one more question. Just, just to continue with those things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That that would be an excellent way for you to be able to spin up a VM or a or a physical as long as your repo machine isn't the one that gets hosed. Uh, you could you could spin up either even a physical host or a uh, uh, a VM and pull all of your files locally. That's certainly a, a way to go about it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much and uh, I appreciate your time. Leave that up.